morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for inviting me uh, to Sheffield to address you entrepreneurs. It's a great treat to be able to talk to entrepreneurs. Uh, I am an entrepreneur like you, um, and I probably, like you, get fed up when I meet a junior manager from PricewaterhouseCoopers who tells me he's an entrepreneur. He's not an entrepreneur. You are an entrepreneur. You have put your own money into your own business. You take your own risk, and if you fail, uh, it's an expensive failure. You can't go and make a video and say, I'm sorry. You have to actually lose money. Um, I'm, um, I'm hoping that today, or rather this morning's session, the slot I've got, which is frighteningly only a few minutes, might be the one that makes you the most money. So that's quite a challenge. Let's see what we can do uh, to uh, live up to that. So the first question is, is why, why are you an entrepreneur? Why have you taken the risk? What's... Um, What's, what, what's the purpose in you be, being so? And uh, for some, it's an interesting combination. For some, it's the excitement, it's the, rec it's the recognition that you have to be on your own, it's the challenge. Uh, for some, it's the opportunity to prove to your former boss you're not the Muppet he thinks you are. Um, but for many, and for most, it's probably um, to try and make a lot of money. And, and that is uh, the goal for most entrepreneurs. And today is, if you like, some wrap round on how to do that. But um, it's often important to try to, to make sure you remain focused uh, on the ultimate reward. And for many, the ultimate re reward is the sale of the business you started. Some can't let go. Some have a vision of it going down to their great-great-grandchildren. And I have actually sold a business once. I've, Cavendish has been involved in selling nearly 500 businesses. But I have actually been involved in selling a business once that was started uh, in 1780. And it was run by the founder's great, great, great grandchild. And he absolutely hated his position and the responsibility that that came with it. So for most entrepreneurs, the objective and uh, ultimate goal is to sell for a large sum of money, which, as I, I'm assuming most of you no, is calculated as a multiple of profit. And I'm sort of going slow here because it's a glib phrase that we've all used, the multiple of profit. And these days, most businesses are valued as a, as a multiple of EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. And it's a bit of an irritating uh, valuation, actually, because it's been brought in by the Americans focusing on cash. It's a fair enough way of valuing a business but it's deceptively small because the average EBITDA for most businesses multiple is something like six. But what that is in real money, by which I mean a multiple on profits after tax, which is how we used to do it, but the multiple of profits after tax average is something like 10. So what does that multiple of 10 mean? It means that someone is going to pay you 10 years of hard work in one hit. Wow. So. If your objective is making money and over your working lifetime, and let's say your working lifetime is roughly 20 to 65, roughly, and in that 45 years, you want to have the biggest row of beans you can possibly have from the beginning of zero, how do you get the biggest row of beans at the end of the 45 years? And the answer, if every four or five years you can sell out for 10 times the amount of money you're making at the moment, so you see the growth as a serial entrepreneur. And you see that it's sitting and going around your heads is, just a minute, why am I planning 20 years in my business when if I sold out in four years, started up again after a year's break in the Caribbean, sold out another four years, it, it all works out. So, so that is our objective. And um, um, wh why does it happen? Why, why do businesses sell? Well, we understand why the seller sells. Why do buyers buy? Um, now, it's not a question I often ask the buyers when I'm sitting opposite them. <laughs> just don't want them to wake up. But it's actually often because you are fantastic at coming up with brilliant ideas, like our friend who sat feeding his baby and worked out that here's something that other people would want. And you come up with that creative, brilliant starting spark that large corporates cannot do and will not do. And therefore, they feel that they need to buy what you've got. They're also very arrogant, and they think that they can do what you do, what you've got better than you, which they can't, but they think that, so that's great. 
And they have people who are employed to do nothing but go and buy companies whom we love. So um, you need to talk to them about uh, making a very large offer for your business, and they want to do it. So the big question is, how do I get there? How do I um, make it happen? And how do I make um, buyers buy my business? And the, um, the overseas buyers are the most attractive. Uh, why are they most attractive to you as a seller of business? Well, first of all, the overseas buyers in particular need to acquire your business to break into your market. Your competitors and, your, and the people down the road and others in the UK can do it much easier by organic growth. Whereas an overseas buyer, if they want to come into the UK, it just makes a lot of sense to make an acquisition. And they often can't leverage their own brand in the UK. They may have a fantastic brand in their country. It means nothing over here. So the way they've got to sell product in the UK is to acquire your brand, which you've built up successfully, and they're in. And it is, of course, a preferred route for you to sell your business to an overseas buyer rather than some of the other obvious people. And I've often had clients who've come to me and have said, I only want to sell my business to overseas buyers. I only want you to talk to overseas purchasers. Uh, a client of mine called Pat Fitzpatrick, I don't know whether you will, some of you will have seen Fitzpatrick Construction, very large construction company. And he said to me, only talk to overseas buyers. Why? He, because, he said, I don't want to talk to my competitors. I don't want to be part of Tarmac. I want my name, Fitzpatrick, to be continued, and it will do by an overseas buyer. I, want, uh, I don't want to have to talk to my suppliers, and um, I think that the chance of confidentiality being breached is much, much lower if I don't talk to my competitors, but I talk to people from overseas. And he said that an overseas buyer will want my management team. They will keep my management team. My competitor will just get rid of them. And it's much more attractive to me to think that I'm going to sell my business to someone who wants to keep the people who helped me build it up. And he was quite right, and we did. And we sold the business to Volker Vessel, a large um, Dutch company, and you will still see to this day Volker Vessel Fitzpatrick on a large number of construction projects uh, around the UK. And lastly, um, uh, overseas companies um, now have overtaken private equity in their ability to pay because private equity ability to pay, which was fantastic three or four years ago, is much, much harder because they can't get the debt into the deal to help them make the, get to the price. So overseas buyers know that they can compete on price uh, with UK buyers, and uh, they also recognize that to come into the UK, they need to pay a premium, and that's what they're doing. So what does the figures actually look like? Well, here are the actual figures. Top line is value bottom line is volume. And you say to yourself, hang on a minute, what's going on here? Why such a big discrepancy? And the answer is that it is much more likely and easier to sell a large company than a small company. And typically, small, smaller companies are sold to UK purchasers. Large uh, companies are often sold to multinationals. So the, the value is much higher than the volume. So your, your challenge is how do you get into the 30% odd of uh, companies that are sold to overseas buyers? And that is, is what we're, we're focusing on today. Of that 30%, who actually buys them? And these are the actual, these, this is where the buyers in 2012 to date have factually come from. Um, Self-explanatory, um, other than the 5% is not Peru, it's the whole of the rest of the world just having to fit it there. And it's quite interesting to look at this uh, because it's not necessarily what you would expect or what you're being led to believe. That without any question, the largest purchaser or the most, most frequent purchaser of overseas companies will be North America. Of that 39%, nearly all of it is USA, a touch Canada. Our so-called um, European partners only account for 41%, and that's the whole of, of uh, all the countries within Europe probably not a huge amount from Greece, uh, but there's a lot of Scandinavia in there, a lot of Greek, uh, Germany, um, uh, a surprising amount actually from Italy and even Spain. But that's, that's the, all of the... And, and then Asia is, is really very small, isn't it? And the, there is so much hype about uh, Asian making acquisitions, and it, it, it is hype. 
And the truth of the matter is it is very, very difficult to sell a business, particularly an SME business, to the Asian market. And within that 15%, a large slug is Japan, by the way, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore. So the amount coming from China, India, um, is pretty small. And it's very easy to think to yourself, well, I will find a chap who comes from China on the slow boat who arrives and pays a huge price for my business. The reality is it's very difficult. And there are also cultural reasons. Certainly in China, Hong Kong, um, they are not used to the concept of purchasing for a business, 100% of a business. What they will do is enter into negotiations with you, smilingly and happily, but end the negotiations by offering you a joint venture, which for the Anglo-Saxon culture is not what you want, because much as you like doing business with people, actually your objective is cash in your pocket. And there is a cultural differential here which has got a long way to go before we see a large amount of uh, M&A activity from Asia to the UK. So it's helpful to us to understand what it is, what it is where we're we going, where we we're slightly uh, to achieve real value. Um, and, but does it really happen? Well, this year to date, um, these are the sort of transactions that we've undertaken, um, and they're all uh, SME businesses uh, that have come to us and said, what do we do? And they've all, uh, of the 500, every single business has a story, as, uh, uh, as we were hearing earlier on. But I thought I'd highlight some of these case studies, because they, they've all got, they were quite interesting. The Royal Berkshire Shooting School, if you can read it on the left, is, as the name says on the tin, a shooting school based in Berkshire. Um, with uh, pretty limited uh, expansion plans, uh, pretty limited growth possibilities. It's based on the green belt. Uh, uh, it, it won't go grow much bigger than it is. So we talk to all our partners around the world, and we have 46 partners around the world, different uh, 41 countries, about ideas that they might have. And fortuitously, our partner in Chile knew of a guy uh, called uh, Alex Newman, who um, was an Anglophile and absolutely loved anything English and loved shooting. And most fortuitously, had just married into the second wealthiest family in Chile who'd said, here's 10 million, go play. And, um, and he came over to the UK and uh, bought uh, Royal Berkshire Shooting School uh, just a couple of years ago. Moral of the story is, you've got to have a bit of luck, but you've got to be able to spread your net pretty wide. Seafood holdings uh, supply nearly all the fish to London restaurants and out of London restaurants and hotels. Fantastic distribution business run by a fantastic entrepreneur called Toby Baxendale, who built it up over time. And the obvious purchaser for that was a South African company called Bidvest. And Bidvest are a very large uh, conglomerate, so large that they have um, a corporate finance office in London. But rather than ring the Corporate Finance London office in London, we asked our South African partners to ring the chairman, who's called Brian Joffe, in Johannesburg. And they caught him on the golf course, and they talked to him about seafood holdings in London. And uh, he said, that really interests me. And he came over to London, and to cut a long story short, he bought the business. He paid a good price for it. And after he, we had done the deal, the people, the Corporate Finance people in London had said to us, if this deal hadn't emanated from Brian Joffe in Johannesburg championing it, it would never have happened. Because the culture of Bidvest was if we'd have gone up the ladder to try and take it to Brian, the not invented here syndrome uh, would have meant it would never have happened. But it did happen. So the moral of the story is you have to understand the purchaser well. You have to understand the culture of the purchaser, the type of organization it is, whether you're best to start at the top and work down or start at the bottom, get a champion and work up, and each are different. Hawkeye, I'm sure you'll know Hawkeye, it's the company that um, uh, measures where the tennis ball lands and um, in Wimbledon. And we ended up selling it to Sony. And that was a very difficult negotiation. Um, and it's a very happy acquisition since, and you'll see it's now called Hawkeye Sony on the, on the television screens. The um, deal closed, one in March 2011, and it's not important the month, it's important is the date, it closed one week before the tsunami. It would not have happened one week later. But the moral of that transaction was if you're going to talk to people like Sony, large multinationals, you have to allow a lot of time. And last, 
uh, Rally, which is a name most of you will remember. Many of you have had a big chopper in your youth, which you will have enjoyed. And uh, we, we, it's a fantastic underrated brand. It's a, a brand that every, everyone knows, but has never really capitalized on it. And we sold that for $100 million to a Dutch business that um, was uh, in the cycling business and had to break into the UK because none of you have ever heard of Excel Group. We certainly hadn't, but they had heard of Rally. And the moral of that story was, even if you're losing a fortune, it doesn't matter. Make sure you protect your brand because that's what people are going to be paying for. So I've been flashed. I've only got a very, very short time, which is very sad because there's lots I'd love to tell you about it. But how do you actually do it? Well, you do need to get um, uh, uh, it plugged into a, uh, someone who's got a local network to find a buyer that you would never have heard of. You do need to give yourself a lot of time to plan a sale exercise, particularly if you think a multinational is going to be the likely buyer. You really have to make sure that you or your advisor is au fait with the cultural sensitivities of the purchaser. What is going to turn them on? What worries them with lots of purchasers? They're worried about environmental issues. They're worried about your liabilities. So if you plan ahead, you can deal with the issues that worry them, which means, lastly, the most important thing is the, is, the, is the planning. Are you planning your business to maximize profit? If so, why? Why not think about planning your business to grow it to maximize its capital value? Because not only can you sell it for a multiple of several years of profit in one hit, you end up paying tax at 10% instead of 40%. Bit of a no-brainer, but on that point, I thank you and uh, look forward to meeting as many of you afterwards as, as want to. All the best. Thank you.